Hello, Anna and Tanvir. Hi. Hi. Um, hello, everyone hey. who's watching us on this amazing global Wiki TV station. Um, we're glad that you're with us, although we cannot see you very well. But we hope there will be some small string of connection uh, happening between us because we know you can share with us your questions and we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, but my name is, by the way, Alec. Um, and I'm very happy that we'll be having this conversation about the paradox of open. But before we start, we agreed that each of us will uh, introduce uh, themselves and Anna will go first. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna Mazgal. I am Senior EU Policy Advisor working on behalf of our community in Brussels uh, and talking to EU institutions about issues of concern. Currently speaking to you from Berlin. Tanvir. Thank you, Anna and Alec. My name is Tanvir Hassan. I'm joining you from Mysore, India. I work with the Community Resources Team at the Wikimedia Foundation. Over to you, Alec. Thank you. And my name is Alec Tarkovsky. I'm Strategy Director at Open Future Foundation, a recently founded think tank for the open movement. I'm also on the board of Creative Commons. Uh, and I consider myself a friend of Wikimedia. I'm a member of the Polish Wikimedia Association, uh, but uh, not a very active contributor, but nevertheless really think a lot about Wikimedia. Um, and I think this description of a friend <laughs> is very fitting, uh, I think. So um, uh, welcome, Anna and Tanvir. And basically this session, although it has this formal name, I think of a panel or a discussion, it's actually a conversation. I uh, really wanted to have this conversation about an idea that's very important for me and that I want to start with uh, this session by introducing a bit. It's an idea that there's a paradox uh, connected to openness. Um, um, basically, by saying that, I think the basic uh, idea is that openness changes over time. I think even saying that is already not said often enough. Uh, the open movement, open ways of doing things, open ways of sharing uh, approaches that emerged uh, by now, 20 years ago, some of them even later, such as, you know, free software really are in flux. They change over time and the context in which openness happens also changes. And we really need to be asking how open changes. This is important for me personally, because I've been doing this by now for around 15 years. As a much younger person, I uh, founded the post chapter of Creative Commons, sort of very energetic and excited as a young uh, man to be doing that. And then over the last 15 years, I've, I've been observing the movement, observing Creative Commons and partner projects like um, Wikimedia and seeing how they develop. And the paradox of open is an attempt by me and my colleague Paul Keller from the Open Future Foundation, who uh, wrote this essay together with me, um, to come to terms with what's happening. So what is happening? Here's the short story. If maybe some of you had a chance to look at this essay, if not, uh, you can easily uh, find it online on our webpage, uh, and uh, I would encourage you to read it. It's sort of a story of what happened to open. Here's how it goes. Uh, somewhere around the turn of the century, we were all very enthusiastic and had this very bold, uh, optimistic and utopian visions about openness as a idea that empowers the world, uh, that the, an idea that arounds, allows more freedom, uh, more justice, simply a better world, better internet, but also a better society. And with this idea, we started creating projects like Creative Commons, Wikimedia, open access publishing, open education, uh, and then open data, open hardware. I could go on and on and on. Um, but then, uh, probably after a decade, we started seeing that some that the revolution basically didn't happen. Maybe we need to wait for it a bit longer, uh, as is the case with open access. Uh, but in some areas, it seems it simply will not happen. The really big Creative Commons idea was open music. And I think by now we all know there will not be some mainstream uh, Creative Commons licensed uh, album probably coming uh, soon. That's pretty clear. So uh, this, this uh, revolution didn't happen, but something else happened in the meantime. The online ecosystem really changed and these huge online platforms emerged, uh, which are today usually called big tech based on models uh, that are usually, I, I really like the term extractive, right? So they take resources like our attention, data, personal data about us, content that we create, 
uh, and extract value from it we often or usually without contributing to this ecosystem. I think this part of the story is very often told. What we try to add to it when we say paradox of open, that, that openness plays a role in all of this. Uh, where are we with openness today in the year 2021? On one hand, I think it's still a very strong vision of a better world. Some might say it's overly optimistic or naive. Uh, I believe uh, still in open, basically. Um, but I need to acknowledge that at the same time, uh, openness um, enables some of the problems we face. And uh, the case that we usually mention when we try to describe it is a case that emerged around three years ago, uh, which has to do with photographs of faces of people. Uh, most of these photographs uh, can be found on Flickr, but also in places like Wikimedia Commons. And it turns out that um, several years ago, big companies like IBM started basically crawling these uh, databases of photographs and looking for photos they can use to train AI systems. Uh, and indeed, they created data sets they, that play a fundamental role in training AI for all sorts of uses, both uh, research and commercial, both benign and actually military systems. Um, and this is a story that shows some sort of limits to this idea, um, this basically value of sharing. Uh, limits of imagination, people who shared photos of themselves 10 years ago say, I never imagined uh, AI will be doing this, uh, being trained, or, or AI researchers more, maybe more correctly. Um, People point to limits of open licensing itself because they say, well, this provides no protection uh, for our personal data. So this is sort of an exemplary case, but there are probably many uh, others we can mention. Maybe Tanvir and Anna will share uh, their cases. Um, so basically, we say in the essay that openness is both a challenge and an enabler of concentrations of power. Uh, and this is the paradox uh, we are facing. So uh, wrapping up this uh, short introduction, it's important to mention Wikimedia because we are at Wikimania. And Wikimedia is actually a bit unique in this story because when I said the revolution did not happen, I actually believe that Wikimedia did cause a revolution. It is a unique project, maybe not the only one, I could mention a few more, but uniquely successful, uniquely proving uh, that open sharing can function. And uh, I also think, which I think is not said often enough, I think of Wikimedia as a platform, which again is very just, you know, it's not tracking users, it's not using data to display ads. A lot of good things happen on Wikipedia and also on related uh, Wikimedia projects. So, um, but at the same time, the Wikimedia community, I think, faces just the same challenges related to concentrations of power, related to how Wikimedia content is being used uh, and possibly value is extracted from it. Um, and this is the point where I will stop uh, and ask Anna and Tanvir to, because I'm curious how you see this paradox. And I hope you'll also say a bit more about this from a Wikimedia perspective as you're a lot more engaged in, uh, in this movement. And we didn't agree who will go next. So um, let's see. Whoever presses mute, unmute first can go. <laughs> like in some TV show. Well, I, the way of, of, you know, like trying to let the other person through the door first um, uh, in this situation. Uh, there's definitely lots to say. First of all, I want to encourage everyone to read it. Really, it's a very good piece of, of not only analysis, but also sometimes, you know, uh, there is something like, uh, you know, paralysis by analysis, right? We, we get too much in the woods. It's actually, to me, the sort of bird's eye, eye, eye view on, on where we are. And it points me to um, in a lot of directions and, and kind of sums up for me a lot of thinking that I had myself doing projects uh, with the wildly recognized, let's call it open movement, right? For, for the lack of, of, uh, of a better thing. I, I can totally see how, you know, this thinking also evolves and come and we have proof uh, of, of what you're, you're saying, uh, namely the way I understand it is that you're saying that you know, the, 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 the hell is paved with good intentions in a sense that our projects are, um, you know, created from the good place and, and definitely serve many good purposes. But of course, because they are open and so indiscriminatory in who, in, in who can be the recipient of them, they become um, used uh, for, for many purposes. 
And of course, you can say it about many inventions of humankind, right? Uh, that that this happens, and uh, and whoever first uh, discovered a knife maybe didn't really think it's gonna be, you know, a deadly weapon, right? But uh, moving on from from banalities like this, I think we are in this particular moment in which we really can see that whenever we look, if it's about music, if it's about content, if it's about agriculture, if it's about um, access to healthcare and to medicines, we basically see the same kind of story, the same anecdotal evidence uh, about how basically the system that is now uh, being set up is, is the system in which casino always wins, right? So as you rightly point out in your essay or, or in your analysis, basically the, the one who has the best resources to reuse whatever is being produced in the open movement will win, right? And the rest, you know, may be helped by it or may not be helped by it. Uh, it may be for, you know, people in, in the global north, as we know, a question of whether to pay for something or get it for free, but also we know, and uh, and and we had this con those conversations with Tanvir many times, in other places uh, in the world, it's a question of having access to something or not having access at all, right? Because of barriers in, in, in resources and, but also in barriers in, in availability of things. So. Um, so this is also where I, I see it, it, it rings very true to me. I want to tell about, say, about two examples where actually, which prompted me into thinking that this is really the case. And then hopefully we can also talk not only about how bad the world is right now and how great it was when the web was decentralized and we didn't have the big uh, platforms, uh, basically, you know, five people deciding, you know, what's on the menu uh, today. Uh, but we also can talk about what we can do about this. But one was definitely when uh, Susan Wojcicki at one of the conferences in the US was tackling the issue of disinformation. And she basically, without I understand telling anybody uh, from, uh, from Wikimedia, she basically said, well, and we have this great idea that whenever there is a video that is peddling some conspiracy theory or some, um, you know, other content like uh, that, that is really you know not true or, or false, we will basically put uh, links to articles on Wikipedia and people can go and verify, right? Which basically means, well, this is our, the way I read it, this is our new idea, how to privatize uh, the, the profits and socialize the cost by sending all those trolls that are watching those videos to Wikipedia and let them fight with the editors that do all that work for free. So to me, that was first this, this, this wake up call in a way to say, hey, there is something fundamentally wrong, not with, how we maybe do things, but how basically the, the system is rigged against uh, open project in a sense that they are treated as something that is basically there to be used and to be captured and to actually be, um, uh, be uh, and, and there's no like social return on that, uh, on that capture, right? The, the, those companies don't give back. And I think this is where, um, and also there's a question how they should give back. It's, it's, it's not an easy one, right? Um, and the second was also unfortunately uh, uh, um, involving uh, involving Google and more precisely YouTube is when YouTube apparently had this idea that basically uh, the, the public domain content that we host should be actually uh, not scraped from YouTube, but, uh, but the videos should be embedded, which of course means that uh, everybody who interact, interacts with such content that is embedded is actually exposed to Google surveillance machine. And, um, and, and, I, and I find it, uh, you know, at, at best uh, as, as basically complete inability to, to sort of check the temperature of the room and, uh, and, and, and see who, okay, who are those people that, that, that we're dealing with. Um, and and the, the damage such, uh, such a change would bring to our project and, and to all that we stand for, I think would, would basically chase us, you know, in the years to come, right? So, uh, so to me, these were the two uh, the, the two examples where where that was actually really entering our yard. And and the third one, obviously, I like what, what you mentioned, the the training of data. But I can talk, as you know, uh, for a long time. So I'm gonna stop here and and uh, pass over to Tanvir and uh, and uh, speak at some other point in this conversation. Uh, thank you so much, Anna. Uh, to pick up from the point that Alec was earlier making about open being a paradox because both it's uh, an enabler and also a direct challenger to the way that opportunities come, right? There's also a double paradox there. If you look at the way open has emerged and has evolved, the earliest of the open came from the bourgeois class to help create a very proliterate open. I'm using uh, 
dated terms here, but just bear with me for this example. But at this point, open is also becoming a fad, wherein the proletariat class is creating a very bourgeois open, which means that you would have all of this content that's available for you for reusing, for remixing, and to work with it. But what is the relationship between the influence and the importance of the content? Because if you really think about open, there are two things that come to you right away. The validity of open does not go with numbers. It's just something that's picked up now. We've been talking about the importance of a platform only when YouTube has prompted us to say about views or Facebook has given us options to measure how many likes we have or how many friends we have. The legitimacy of open was not on these numerical or very quantitative, right? It was at the level of importance. It was at a very high intellectual level. So there's a, there's a relationship there that we need to understand. If you look at the earlier open that was created by bourgeois people, but uh, again, sorry for the term, but then the, the open was very hardworking in nature. The open was very utilitarian in nature. And what did it do? It did not look for influence. It looked for important. Content which became, which was important became influential and that's how we started understanding of our open. But if you look at the future of the open, it's not as simple as that. It's completely reversed and that's the double paradox. Here is content coming from emerging communities, emerging markets, however you want to put it. And then that content is being repacked to talk about influence, to not talk about importance. So as long as Open does not want to take this question head on and say, where do we situate the future of our movement? So Open is this beautiful idea, is this brilliant idea that's had troubled past and is going to have a difficult future. But all is not lost, like Alex said. What we need to now try to understand or try to unpack is, for the difficult future, are we going to make it difficult for the users, difficult for the contributors? Are we going to make it difficult for, for people who come to open to, to work with it or to profit from it? The commercialization or the extractive, the word that Alec used earlier, is a key denoter here. By the nature or by the ethos of open, it's going to be inclusive or it should strive to be inclusive. But it does not mean that it should make it easy for everybody. And that's probably where we'll get into the conversation around enterprise, we'll get into the conversation around monetization. Just because we are calling something open or just because something is termed as open does not mean that it should be flat. It can have varied uh, interactions. It can have varied understanding of how do we work with various stakeholders. If you're going to say that it's a flat world or it's a flat uh, domain and you would be able to run as much as you want simply depending upon what skills and what capacity you have, you're taking away the inherent value of something that's created out of a system of values. And what you're just leaving there is a platform. I don't think that's the strength of open. The strength of open, like Alec has pointed out and uh, the two examples that Anna gave, very vividly illustrated, is that, the, is that the values that were created is not at the level of the platform. So we also need to try and have a conversation about if today this is the way that we understand this platform, what are probably the other ways to talk about it? Uh, I'll, I'll just give a very simple thinking that I have in my head and then I'll hand it back. Uh, so there is something called a Bollywood phenomena that happens a lot in India. So think of a movie uh, that has like a like almost a stereotype or a formulaic uh, thing. If you have 10 or 15 such movies or 10 or 15 such uh, previous examples, it's not going to go any further. But you tweak it a little bit and then that movie is going to become a commercial hit. And what happens is very interesting. You're going to get the same kind of formula repeated again and and again. This is this indicates two things. One is that people do have more attention when something is appealing. So what is it that makes them come back to the same thing when they very well know that this is exactly what is going to happen? So that the predictability of the future is very important when you're trying to engage a large gathering other than a set of committed individuals. So I think that phenomena of ensuring that even with predictability, there is an engagement, there is an opportunity for, for you to work with, will be the future of, of all of this that we're talking about. Sam, thanks. Alec, you're muted. Yes, I muted myself at some point. And <laughs> this requires some technical skill. It's easier to just stay unmuted. I think if you want to do that, I, I don't think it will be a problem if all, all three of us are unmuted. 
also I uh, there's a pretty live uh, uh, audience uh, with the, the etherpad there are already four comments and questions there which uh, obviously creates some challenge for me how to listen to you and, and read it but maybe we'll come to them in a moment and um, we should still talk a moment I wanted to add one thing that that I think builds on what you said Tanvir and that's something that we don't write too much in the paradox of open. It's this category of use and reuse, right? Because uh, for me, the sort of the formula that I have by now memorized by heart is that open is access plus the right to reuse, right? Uh, and for this reason, uh, I think open access is doing very well because reuse is very simple. You just want people to read articles, basically. And maybe it gets a bit complicated today with the... Uh, automatic ways of doing things. And open is, for instance, a lot more complicated in art and education because using things, for instance, a teacher is really making it live, uh, making it adapted to needs of different um, learners and so on. And so this category of reuse is fundamental. And for me, the, the one of the big things I observed over 15 years is that actually a lot of the reuse is not happening. For instance, I've done quite a bit of work on open data where everyone just dreams of reuse, right? open data enabled apps the government shares weather data and there are some amazing new things happening it doesn't seem to be that much the case or as we know it's the big companies that gladly pu pull in the data because they'll always find the use for it as as we all mentioned so for me this is part of the challenge and i understand that's what you tanvir um uh mentioned i really like this flat world idea right that that world is not flat it's complicated and in many places it's hard to participate. Um, but then for me, the challenge becomes, how do we fix that? I'm not sure we'll get there, but, but this is the moment where, where for sure I get stuck a bit. So, so what might be interesting to, to put that question in perspective is what would be the intent of a future open? The intent of our past open is pretty evident, right? It was supposed to be utilitarian in nature. But right now, the intent of open is not just that. Intent of open suddenly became competitive, suddenly became a talent and uh, you know skills showcase. Uh, I mean, could you have imagined that you're going to put something on GitHub and somebody would look at it and say, and hire you on a big tech platform? I don't think in the wildest of the dreams, that was one of the places. So when you have this fight, not, not even fight, let's call it a tussle. When you have this tussle between extraction and intent, something very curious happens. Utility emerges out of it. Now, the question is, when utility starts to emerge, who is the first one to sense it? Somebody who already knows what to do with that is the first one to, uh, to make sense of it. Uh, so so, so, so the, the idea that I'm trying to discuss here is that the radar of utility is not usually active in individuals or a group of committed individuals. I don't think that's what they are committed to do. The radar of utility or the radar of extra extraction is active in corporations because that's what they have been thinking about. If you look at the way that startup hubs talk, innovation hubs talk about, they're not talking about this big scale changes, so to say. They're talking about that next big change that is going to grab our attention, that is going to get us talk about it in a, in a very, um, in a very, um, in a very offhand term, I'm using the term viral here. So if we are not intentional about where our open is going, I think we'll be, we'll be creating a platform, we'll be creating a domain that is going to be rife with opportunities, but also going to never talk about its own problems. Uh, so I think intentional, um, I find that very interesting because that's what, in theory, you're not meant to do with the open, right? You uh, sort of, um, oh, sorry, this will be a bit of a digression, but I read this, you know, sort of idea, a spiritual idea that you make an intention and wait for the universe to solve it. And I realized that's basically what we wanted to do with open, right? Like, we don't know what's going to happen to it, but the universe will find the use. And it wasn't the universe, but YouTube, <laughs> it seems. Um, but so that's a pretty bleak image, right? If only the big gets bigger, uh, what do we do with that? Anna, when, when you hear these cases that you provided, mm -hmm. what's your response to that for the movement or for your advocacy work? Um, well, that's... 
yeah, <laughs> big questions. <laughs> I, I uh, thanks, Sanvir, for, for framing it in, in a way of, of basically sort of reimagining what this could be, because I think it's very important. I, um, for me, the one of the most important, interesting threads in the conversation about how to even approach, you know, like renegotiating what open is if we agree that, you know, we don't want to just produce content and not care how it's used, right? If we want to be able to 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 look at it broader, is to actually look at the other end of it, um, and um, which is basically, you know, what are the rights of people and communities to refuse to be open first? And bear with me, and 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 I'll explain because if we uh, if we pave over that, we also do, and thank you, Tanvir, for saying this is a bourgeois <laughs> open. I completely agree, because you know what bourgeois had and what was the greatest invention of bourgeois? Leisure time. And what you can do during leisure time? You can volunteer. And I think this is something that we cannot really uh, overstate, that it's a luxurious situation to be able to, to be part of that movement uh, as a hobby or as something that is very, very important. And by hobby, I by no means want to diminish it, but but you have to have the time, which means that the food is on your table, that uh, your family is provided for, that you have all sorts of other things taken care of by yourself and also by the society that you live in. So so one example was when I went to um, the Chaos Communication Congress and there was a, a, a village of, of uh, queer anarchist, uh, beautiful folks and and they put out a lot of uh, posters that you could take or, or just, uh, you know, make a donation. And many of those or, or brochures or texts, um, uh, all sorts of things like that. And, um, and many of them uh, were licensed as a Creative Commons non-commercial license. And I spoke about this with them because to me, this was always the kind of a failure of the open. Why do we even have that license? It's really weird, right? And I understood that this is their way of saying we want to share it with people who know what to do with it. We don't want to share it with people that want to extract that value. And if they want this, they need to ask us. And then we decide whether we agree. But if somebody wants to do it for commercial purpose, then they have to go through that process, right? It's not to say that uh, all commercial uses could potentially be bad or hurtful or, or in any way diminishing the original message. It's just to say that many of the of the uses are commercial, that those that those people don't want, right? And the other end of this conversation happens uh, a lot, I think, when we are in touch with uh, with uh, indigenous communities and people working with them and and trying to evaluate how we can um, actually be of service to uh, to that endeavor. And and uh, uh, Tanvir and I already had this conversation a couple of times with our friend Alejandro, who always also brings that perspective that basically the what we consider as sharing and as something that is uh, unambiguously good. To, to many of those communities is yet another form of colonialism coming to extract what they have, right? They already gave. Many of those things never came back to them. Think of medicinal knowledge. Think of, uh, you know, the, the devastation that comes with actually extraction of, of resources, but also of, you know, anthropologists coming and asking the same questions again and again and not understanding things and, and basically taking their time. So, so we also need to think about that, you know, if we want to be responsible in the open, we need to also respect people's rights to say no. Uh, we don't want to do it that way, or we want to do it with parts of that and actually help actively to find protocols that help them feel comfortable on their level of, of what they want to have open or not, right? And not say, oh, no, these people don't understand what it's about. They are not with us, right? I think this is also a part of that conversation that, that we need to take care of. They may be because they understand the value of that. They are just not in the position to give anymore, right? So so this is something that, that to me is very important and I have lots of questions still. How can we be, be better uh, uh, helping those communities and how can we better, you know, adjust uh, what we have or, or provide our knowledge to, uh, to serve them in a way that is good for them and not only for us. There's something else that's uh, very interesting here. So, when I say that uh, open has become extractive or open has allowed extractive nature, ex extractive forces to operate and to shape some of it, I'm not against the gains here. I don't think gain is the problem here. Profiteering is the problem here. And I, I understand that in open it's understood and it's accepted that profiteering is a very viable and probably even a welcome way. But there has to be an 
an integral way of talking about it if you look at it if you look at open as a philosophical concept who are the people or what are the levels in which uh, gain should happen either the platform should gain or the partner should gain or the people should gain in an ideal condition all of these three will gain that's the the real philosophy or that's like the uh, embodiment of the open philosophy that the platform gains mm -hmm. and then the people who are associated with the platform uh, gain and probably a partner will also gain but when you try to subside either of these and make it one is to three or make only one part of this try and have an unnatural or an unexpected on an exponential growth i think that's the problem uh, that i'm trying to talk about here it's not about commercial success it's not about somebody making money it's about what those resources do when you have made money that's the question just like the content that comes in like almost everybody who's in the session here come into this conversation with a good intention about open and that's a challenge that open has not been able to grapple until very recently what is what happens when your intention about open is in direct contradiction or is in a complete paradoxical nature of the way that you imagine it we are willing to disagree with people but what if you are willing to disengage or what if you are not willing to engage with people at the level of open what happens when fake news wants to claim a piece of open because it's open right that's the way that we have framed it so that's the point where a lot of our next generation problems and next generation contentions around open are going to happen it's no longer going to be about whether open is utilitarian or not i think that's today's problem the next problem is not going to be about utility at all the next problem the next big problem about open is going to be about are you really open because we have already seen this we have seen this in three different spheres we have seen this in the way academic world has worked we have seen this in the way that research has worked we have also seen this in the way publishing has happened the next territory where or the next domain where this is going to happen is in open and are the stewards of open prepared for this uh, either at the level of the institution or at the level of individuals or even at the level of the way that we want to intellectually present that the reason why i'm such a big believer in wikimedia projects and probably osm to a great uh, extent is because we have found a way to talk about it there are regulations we still don't have a philosophy to talk about it but we have a process to talk about it and hopefully this process will grow and evolve with all the questions that come but if you want to just say open and forget it or open and just leave it at that there are no processes and where will those processes happen that process will not happen when you create an article the process will happen when you talk about the problem so i think that's that's again something that we have to look at our institutions to do this so uh, i'm i'm just going to do a little bit of uh, uh, an advocacy pitch here the institutions that are level of the at the level of the working of the community should take the question of content and also should take the question of the future of the content uh, we will get content if uh, you know uh, by and by with all of the communities coming in with all of the new developments in technology we are going to get content uh, i don't think we are hard pressed for content quality of content yes i agree but what about the future of the content when do we get to talk about it because that question is very symmetrically and very symbiotically linked to the future of open um if i can add something listening to both of you um i keep coming back to this uh, thought that that i keep having in my head when i think about the continuation of this essay so let me start by saying that that this original open has the advantage of being a simple right you said flat world flat world is like a very simple place you you know what it's going to look like and um the simplicity for sure allow these open models to scale um and i think the whole challenge is that the moment we start talking about managing it 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 needs to stop being so simple that's not a problem yet though it is a challenge right but fundamentally maybe it can be solved though to be honest there seem to be a lot of conversations using terms like ostromian commons right so managed commons regulated commons um but but i don't see this happening in real life and my one worry is that I think one of the best mechanism we have today for managing content are algorithms and I think the big sort of 
to say it in, in simple terms, advantage of Wikipedia is that when I open the front page, it doesn't algorithmically choose an article that I should read. And that's a huge advantage of open uh, that people often don't talk about, right? This is a philosophical choice, by the way. You could very easily, there's nothing in open stopping the open platforms from doing that. But, but most of them, I, I, and I'm, I haven't researched this, but my gut feeling is you, you, you don't do it. Um, and, and, and that's my, my worry that I think the, a lot of ideas about uh, managing commons, managing permissions, managing responsibility will quickly have to shift to IT tools. By the way, I need to say uh, one, two things. We have 10 minutes left. Uh, and we have a lot of comments in our etherpad that I'm basically, <laughs> I'm very sorry to our listeners, unable to process what I think I, I can do. I don't know about whether Tanvir and Nana have time. I'm, I'm happy to join you in our Remo world uh, and maybe chat with you a bit because honestly, we have no way of, of um, addressing them. But I'm very happy we're, maybe I can ask one question from the comments at the end because it's a cool provocative question. Anyway, Anna and Tanvir, maybe you want to continue. I, I actually uh, was looking at the, at the comments and there is one that I specifically want to address because it was really something that, that was on my mind as well. So somebody says, so if we have gone from the utilitarian to bourgeois, does that mean we need a revolution, an upheaval? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think it's a very good question, uh, as provocative as it may seem uh, to some, that I agree with Tanvir that the question of, of today, you know, are, are very quickly followed by the question of tomorrow. And to me, the question of tomorrow is that we sort of need to have a conversation on a very general level of what do we do with this world as it is of now? Because also, you know, part of this conversation is about to what extent to me, one of the questions, if you talk about platforms recapturing, you know, things and, and benefiting from them and not giving back is that basically, you know, can we, by producing more content or shielding it somehow, can we basically change the way the world works, right? Or not, right? But do we even want to, right? And I, and I think the question is, and it's the same question for, you know, for Creative Commons community, which I think there are a lot of overlaps with, but, but, but also in, in terms of licensing, right? Is what do we really want to do? What do we want, you know, uh, as a community, as a movement? Do we want to make this world better, which basically to me would mean or, 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 you know, kind of uh, patch what's not working, which basically means that we are following after some deficiencies and try to fix them. But in general, we have no problem with how things are set up. Or do we actually say, well, the problem why, you know, the, the content is being used that way is not that we do something wrong, but that what I said before, that the actually system is rigged against that, right? Mm -hmm. System is a, a very eager to, to capture free labor and not give anything back, right? So this is, so do we need a revolution, right? And it's not a question, you know, I may have my personal view whether we need it. If you ask me, yes, I think we do. But uh, of course, it's not for me on me to answer. I think we, we owe ourselves this conversation, right? And what it means really, right? What it means for the people who have different views about that, right? And generally like the world that it is now because either they benefit from it in some way. Again, no judgment here, right? Or they just, you know, don't question it for, for this or other reason, right? It's, I think, with the strategic discussions in Wikimedia, we came very close to discussing that question in a sense, right? When we talk about knowledge equity, for example, which is basically knowledge justice uh, out of a better way to, to explain it. It doesn't mean that we just move, you know, a bit like scooch a little bit and make a room at the, at the end of the table, you know, and somebody may sit with, you know, half of their, uh, you know, sitting area and, and, you know, listen to what we have to say. No, it means that we have to really sit and face our privilege and confront with it, right? So, so these are also, we have parts of those conversations, but we don't, I think, really have it really, you know, set up, right? What do we do with this mess, right? And it brings me to, to another point that I would just maybe say, and, and, and then that will be my closing, uh, closing remark, is that we lack intersectionality in what we discuss, right? Wikipedia or, you know, or Creative Commons or, or music or uh, open educational resources, what happens with them sometimes, you know, how they are being, used to good or to bad is anecdotal evidence to what happens everywhere, right? Uh, agriculture, same thing, same story, right? And now we see uh, uh, this whole debacle about, uh, you know, uh, IP around uh, COVID vaccines, right? Which is, uh, to be fair, what happens in Europe is disgraceful, uh, how much, you know, resistance is to, is to that. So, so basically to me, this is also something that we, we cannot just look that we have this beautiful encyclopedia and, um, and that's it, right? 
And part of this conversation is to find some sort of overarching narrative that is actually putting together all those efforts that aim at more sharing, more practice, because we focus on the output, we focus here on the content, but it's also practice. It's what people do with their lives, right? How they interact together, what sort of society we, we, we build online. That's important. And we don't get to discuss this, right? And we don't get to also celebrate it. So to me, this is also an important point where we need to open up a little bit and not think only about how many, just to simplify it, uh, even if it's not fair, right? How many, you know, uh, pieces of open content we can put out, right? But also, you know, what is the sum of all that work, you know, for, for, for the humanity and how people can really take part in that, right? Not only by, by you know, checking uh, in uh, which year somebody was born or, or whatever other information they look, but also uh, as, uh, as people who, who then get agency and get freedom and get also to be a part of something that is wonderful. And that I think is, you know, is, is frankly, you know, a great hope for internet if we can continue doing what we do. Tanvir, uh, we're wrapping up slowly. Uh, do you want to make Thanks, one more? Think, yeah, I think uh, I'll just take the last bit that Anna put in the agency question and, uh, and link it with the uh, question of open that we have been talking about. I mean, the idea of big open was romantic, right? That uh, it was it, it was such a romantic idea. We all wanted it to succeed. But if you were to think about it, if, and I still hope that it will succeed, touch wood. But if you think about it, there's something curious at uh, uh, play there, which is if you look at the larger intersectionality or utility uh, that Anna mentioned, the value of knowledge is not as much as it was earlier. There is an inherent drop in the way that we understand value of knowledge. This could be because of the uh, of the n number of resources available, the n number of experts available. But price of education has gone up, and this is when open is functional. So if you take a look at any of the emerging countries and the cost of education, it's gone super, super, super expensive. How did this happen when we had a functional open uh, domain? So we are coming back to the question of the intent. If and and very uh, and and not even theoretically, at, at a very experiential level, if the value of knowledge is contested and if the price of education is high, then what kind of messages are we sending to the larger community that wants to contribute to the corpus of knowledge? I think that's a question that I would leave uh, today to unpack. Thank you. Yeah. So it's slowly time to wrap up. Um... The last thing I want to say, hopefully it connects uh, Tanvir and Nana, your thoughts, this political intentionality is very important and we don't mention it in the essay because the question is of responsibility. I think often the creators of open content are actually not responsible for the power imbalances and are in a very difficult position because one of the only strategies possible would be an exit one, stop doing that. And I'm not actually sure the world would get better without the open projects. Um, but what they should be doing is they should be more political. And, and that, that was how I saw some of the conversations in the movement strategy where I was not happy with the final outcome because I believe that participants in the open movement are people who are already very aware of what goes on in the online environment as compar compared to your average person. And they have a certain obligation to, uh, to use strong words, basically fight for the shape of this environment. And this needs to be done through advocacy, through politics of a sort. Uh, and I see very little of it. I think uh, you're right, Andrew, very often we think this is utilitarian work, producing content. Uh, basically, yes, maybe the content will get produced, but someone needs to defend this model, this, this way of, of being together. Um, and uh, if I was to name something that, that is for me a strong outcome of our conversation as a reminder, to pay attention to that. We have still two minutes, but I think we, we've we uh, reached a certain point of a, a short chat about the future of open. I hope we'll have more chats. I can see more people we should be chatting with uh, in our um, etherpad. Um, uh, Tanvir, you still want to say something, go ahead. I just wanted to give a big shout out to Marty who's taken such excellent notes. I just realized uh, that Marty has been taking very, very good note. <laughs> Thanks, Marty. Thank you, Marty. So uh, thank you to all of you. This is, uh, uh, I personally really like talking about the future of open. I think Tanvir and Nana do as well. So uh, we're happy to find more opportunities to do that. Please get in touch if you find the topic as fascinating as we do and have a great day. Thank you.